I had been down on my luck for a while. When I got the call, with my heart hammering in my throat, I walked across the hotel room and answered it. Hello, I asked in a hoarse voice. Your plane leaves tomorrow morning at 9. You have been approved personally by the shadow man. The lying went dead with a click. I was sweating bullets by this point. I wiped my forehead as my phone dinged with a notification. I looked down, seeing an electronic plane ticket in my email account. A few moments later, it dinged again, alerting me that $200,000 in Monero had been deposited into my wallet. When most people hear of an evil corporation controlling an entire country, they probably think of something like Resident Evil where the Umbrella Corporation controls and destroys whole cities with an iron grip. Or perhaps they think of some apocalyptic dystopia like Philip K. Dick's Blade Runner. I would have thought the same thing, at least before last year when I visited Transnistria and realized that such things were not contained to the world of fiction. Officially, Transnistria is a part of Moldova, an old, poor ex-Soviet wasteland, but the reality is far more complex and interesting. Transnistria declared itself a breakaway country a couple decades ago. No one really blinked when it happened, not even Moldova, a country too poor and corrupt to do much of anything about it. As usual, Russia swept in and made Transnistria a puppet state, a place worse than Russia itself. Transnistria seems to gather all the most evil areas of Russian life and then distills them into a purified dystopian slime, at least for the population size. All of the organized crime, mafias, corruption, disappearances, tortures, and murders of Russia act like the root system of some evil toadstool. And the biggest, most poisonous mushrooms pop up in Transnistria. The plane landed in Moldova, flying low over endless blocks of depressing apartment blocks, cracked streets, and smoking factories. These bleak ex-Soviet cities always reminded me of George Orwell's 1984. Even the colors here seemed somehow duller as if the life, hope, and dreams had been sucked out of the land itself. I got off the plane, lighting a cigarette. As I walked through the airport, a man with a black leather driver's cap dressed in a fashionable suit immediately came up to me, speaking in a thick Russian accent. How was your trip, Jason? He asked. He had eyes like a Siberian husky, as blue and colorless as a melting glacier. His face had fine wrinkles over his chiseled cheeks and chin. I thought I saw the bulge of a pistol under his coat. I gave him a faint smile, feeling tired and jet-lagged, like being buried alive in a coffin for 18 hours, I said. He didn't smile, and his eyes stayed cold and hard. Well, you're here now, he said, extending his hand. I'm Zakar. I'm with Sheriff. I'll be, let's say, protecting you, at least until you return here to head home. I nodded, following him to an expensive Mercedes outside. Zakhar wouldn't let me smoke in the car. Sighing, I pressed my face against the cold window and watched the dreary world pass by outside. The clouds had turned heavy and gray overhead. The people slunk past, most of them with dead, haunted eyes. They walked as if they had the weight of the world on their backs. We drove right across the border into Transnistria. A bored-looking guard smoking a cigarette stopped us, had Zakhar, and me sign our names and show our IDs, and then we were passing out of Moldova. I could see the Transnistrian flag flying over the drab streets and dilapidated houses of this impoverished place. The flag itself was strange, a hammer and sickle pasted on top of two horizontal stripes surrounding a turquoise stripe. It was, I knew, the last flag of any country to still fly the hammer and sickle from the old communist days, and they flew it proudly here in Transnistria. Welcome to Transnistria, a giant stone monolith red. It had been painted with two red stripes on the top and bottom, and a turquoise stripe in the middle, just like the flag of Transnistria. Above it, a massive hammer and sickle loomed, carved out of white stone, and attached to a 20-foot tall granite pillar. This is my first time in Transnistria, I said, breaking the silence. Zakhar grunted, apparently uninterested. Have you lived here long? I'm from Moscow, he said. I'm only here for six months. He gave a condescending look at the potholed streets and smashed streetlights all around us. Thank God, I'll be happy when I'm back in Russia. Is there a McDonald's around here? I'm starving, I asked. Zakhar gave me a withering look. There are no McDonald's or Burger Kings in the entire country of Transnistria, he said. But we have the local beef house. Forget it, I said as he drove deeper into the country. All the cars looked like junk, and a lot of them were ex-Soviet relics barely hanging on by a thread. The newer ones were mostly Russian. The sound of mufflers falling off 
and engines backfiring rang through the cracked streets like gunshots. They followed a twisting river over flat, dark soil with sparse trees. Small villages hugged the curves of the river. After a half hour of driving, we came to a sprawling complex. Armed guards stood at the front of a black gate holding automatic rifles. The symbol for the company was proudly displayed everywhere. They had an old, western-style badge behind blue letters that simply read, Shara. Sakar said something in Russian to the guards. On their jackets, I saw medals from the Russian military. One of them went inside the guardhouse and pressed a button. The enormous gate, with its rolls of razor wire on top of pointed black spikes, began sliding slowly to the side. Your job is fairly simple, Sakar said. As we walked through the hallways of the enormous corporation, on both sides of us, prison cells were set up with star, sunken faces peering out. You just need to transport a single vial to the United States. Is this a prison or a corporation? I asked, motioning to the line of prisoners. Every single cell had at least one person in them, and many of the prisoners showed marks of torture or human experimentation. Fresh surgical scars crisscrossed most of their faces, hands, arms, and chests. As we got further down, many of the inmates appeared totally insane. They run their bloody hands around the metal bars, gnashing their teeth and shrieking in animalistic roars. The last few in the row barely looked human at all. They had long, greasy black hair growing from their heads. Fangs seemed to glisten as they slunk back into the shadows. Their eyes had turned a bright yellow, glowing like a jack-o'-lantern. What are they? I asked in horror. Mutants, super soldiers, wolfmen, sheriff has many aspects. To its business model, Zakar responded. Most of its money comes from alcohol, tobacco, and weapons, but we also do some. Let's say, under the table work for certain pharmaceuticals. We test out certain substances that might not be allowed in other places due to laws or human rights. He spat the last words with a derision that made clear his opinion on such issues. So what's this bile? I asked. Is it related to that? I motioned to the partially changed prisoners. Their agonized eyes flicked over us apathetically. Zakar gave me a cold look. That's nothing you need to concern yourself with, he said. But I will give you a word of advice. Whatever you do, don't ever let it touch your skin. It absorbs instantly, and once it begins affecting your body, there is no way to reverse its effects unless, of course, you enjoy being a mindless killing machine. A mindless killing machine. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I asked. Half joking, but Zakhar would say no more. Sheriff put me up in a local Transnistrian hotel for the night. My plane would be leaving from Moldova the next day, and I was supposed to meet some Russians in New York City and drop off the vial to them. After delivering it, I would receive an additional $200,000. At the time, it looked like easy money. I had quite a bit of experience getting things across borders, anything from counterfeit money to drugs to USB sticks filled with stolen classified information from various governments or corporations. Zakhar had given me the vial. As he dropped me off, it looked like a vial of clear water. I wondered if I was being messed with or perhaps if this was just some sort of test. Regardless, I slipped it into a hidden pocket between the lining of my coat. I ended up going down to the local bar and striking up a conversation with some of the locals. One of them, a hunter and factory worker named Alexei, sat down next to me. I bought him and myself shots of vodka and struck up a conversation with him. He started telling me about how he couldn't go hunting anymore at night, how mysterious deaths had started in the area. My own cousin was found dead just last week, he said, his thick eyebrows coming together in a scowl. His dark eyes looked wide and watery and the burst capillaries on his face showed him to be a heavy drinker. Yet despite all of that, he was stocky, muscular and clearly a worker with heavily calloused hands. We can't live on our factory wages here. If I can't go hunting, I won't be able to feed my family. We sell the extra meat to help make ends meet. You understand? I nodded. What do you mean? He was found dead. Was it an animal attack or something? I asked. Alexei scoffed at that. That's what the police say, but they're just hired bodyguards for sheriff. He spat angrily. They only care when the rich people get killed. If a nobody like my cousin dies. Well, what do you think happened? I said. I was the Volklak. He whispered conspiratorially, leaning close to me. The what? His face seemed to go pale. Werewolves, he hissed with venom. They come out at night. It all started in the woods around the sheriff building. Werewolves, I said, giving a soft laugh. But Alexei's hard eyes quickly silenced me. They're serious. I saw my cousin's body 
he said. As the bartender brought us out more vodka, Alexei's eyes had started to become watery and unfocused. I motioned for the bartender to keep bringing us drinks. I wanted to hear everything this man had to say. It was no regular wolf or bear, nothing like that. I've seen animals and even people attacked by wolves and bears before and those predators go directly for the throat. But it wasn't like that here. Something had ripped his rib cage right open. His intestines were strewn all over the branches of the woods. His bones were snapped into splinters and the marrow sucked out. Something massive and deadly did it. Something larger than any wolf or bear that still lives in this country. And every night, I hear rumors that there are more dead. My own brother caught a glimpse of one. He heard something like the roaring of a bear in his yard and ran outside with his rifle. But it was no bear there. He caught a glimpse of something that walked like a man with a face like a wolf. It had long, black hair, and white talons, enormous fangs, and yellow, slitted eyes. When he fired in the air, the thing turned and disappeared into the bushes, but he felt watched the entire rest of the night. He swore he saw yellow eyes peering out of the brush in the woods behind his house all the way until dawn, and after what I saw, I believe him. After another 15 or 20 minutes of drinking, and smoking, I decided it was time to leave. The bar was closing in a few minutes anyway. I live in that same part of town, Alexei said, rising unsteadily to his feet. His blue eyes looked watery and unfocused. I'll walk with you, much safer, trust me. These are troubled times in this part of the world. Sure, come on, I said. He stumbled after me through the mostly empty bar. The streets outside were dark and deserted. Most of the streetlights they did have long ago burned out. A few of them flickered weakly. Alexei lit a cigarette. As we walked past a cluster of thick evergreens surrounding the curving river, the sudden flash of flame illuminated the bushes nearby, and I caught a glint of eyes. I stopped, but Alexei kept on trotting ahead without even noticing. Alexei, stop. I hissed. He turned, his pale moon face blinking fast in confusion. What? He asked, far too loud. I saw something in the forest. I think something's watching us, I whispered, pointing to where I had last seen the yellow eyes. To my surprise, he reached into his pocket and pulled out an old, Soviet-era pistol. It looked like it might have been new sometime around the time of Khrushchev, but there was nothing there. A black blur leapt down from the top of the tree, crashing through the branches with a cacophony of snapping twigs and whipping leaves. Alexei fired reflexively as something heavy landed on top of his body with a thud. A gunshot cracked through the night air like a cannon blast, shaking me out of my stunned silence. Alexei screamed as silver, razor-sharp claws flashed out of the long, greasy black fur covering the beast's body. Its slitted pupils were dilated with bloodlust and hunger. Its orange irises glowed in the moonlight, shining like an autumn sunset. I reached into my pocket for a switchblade. With a quick flick, I opened it. The werewolf looked up from his meal for a brief moment as I slammed the knife down in a wide arc. It started to raise one clawed hand, but the blade exploded through its shimmering left eye. The werewolf backpedaled quickly. It slammed its claws down over the left half of its face, shrieking in rage and agony. It spun in circles, falling to the forest floor. Its cries weakened as it crawled over the dead leaves and twigs, slowly dying. I looked down at Alexei. He had deep gouge marks all down his face, neck, and torso. One eye had turned into a jelly of gore and dribbling white fluid. He sounded as if he were choking on his own blood. His one good eye looked up at me, and a flash of recognition twisted his dying face. Damn Volkla got me. He wheezed, giving a pained half-smile. He coughed up frothy, bright red blood, spitting it onto the black soil next to his crushed body. It's okay. I got it, I said, glancing back at the werewolf. To my surprise, it wasn't a werewolf at all anymore, but a naked teenage boy with a mutilated, spurting eye. He groaned, raising his hands toward me. Kill me. He whispered, please, finish it. It hurts. I don't want to live like this. How did you end up like this? I asked. Sheriff. They said they were giving free vaccines at the headquarters, but when I got there, they strapped me down and injected me with this clear stuff. I felt it instantly, like fire spreading through my blood. Now, when the sun sets, I feel myself changing, and I have to go hunting. I don't know who I hurt, but I wake up with blood all over me, and I have vague glimpses of screaming boys and girls, old men pleading for mercy, mothers with their throats bitten out. The young boy breathed hard, twisting his thin body. I looked back at Alexei, 
who had stopped breathing. He appeared dead. I heard more growls from all around me, surrounding me in a pack. Yellow eyes flitted from the bushes. I couldn't tell how many more of them had arrived, but I knew I would never escape. I saw at least three of them flitting through the pine trees. The constant babbling of the nearby river mixed with the soft, deadly pattering of their predatory footsteps. I reached down, taking Alexei's pistol from him and firing it into the air. It had no effect. At the last moment, I saw the deadly glint of a pair of eyes appear in the bushes only feet away from me. With a roar, it rushed me. I raised the gun, firing at its open, drooling maw. The bullet smashed through its glistening fangs and came out the back of its throat. It fell back gurgling and suffocating on its blood as its destroyed windpipe worked feverishly. The creature began to change back into an elderly woman. Naked, she raised a thin, trembling hand out toward me and tried to say something, but her spurting throat only made noises of choking and gasping. Within seconds, a harsh death rattle started in her chest. She died, kicking and seizing, still trying to tell me something. I kept getting pushed back into the forest, with only a couple bullets left, and at least three of the creatures stalking and circling me, I decided I had only one choice left. I reached into my secret pocket and brought out the vial. Hesitantly, I popped it open and put it to my lips. Time seemed to slow down, as if every eye in the universe had stopped and turned to look at me. Screw it, I whispered, raising the vial and feeling the liquid drip into my mouth. I swallowed a gulp of the clear fluid. It burned like fire as it went down my throat. I thought it might eat its way through my flesh like a corrosive acid. But within seconds, I felt it working on me. My night vision became instantly enhanced, until I could see the tiniest mosquito flitting through the shadows. I tried to scream as the fire ate its way through my blood, but a deep, guttural roar came out instead. I felt myself growing, as claws ripped their way out of my fingers, and black hairs appeared on my body. I dropped the vial as the last human thoughts and feelings evaporated like a mist under a burning sun. I saw them rushing me, four of them, I now realized with my enhanced sight and smell, but they were small, only five to six feet. I towered over them, twice as tall as the other Valkalek in these woods. Perhaps I had given myself too much of the serum, I thought briefly, and that was the last coherent thought I remember. My memory stops there with the smell of blood and the predatory shrieks of my enemies. It felt like something between a fever dream and a hallucination, but when I awoke the next morning, I knew it had all been real. I found myself naked on the forest floor, leaves and twigs stuck to my hair, dried blood caked my skin, and body. I rose, feeling the sun warming my nude skin. I counted six or seven mutilated bodies strewn across the woods, including that of Alexei. With a silent apology, I began stripping him of his bloody clothes. Needless to say, I never made the delivery of the vial. I don't know what they wanted it for anyway, but I doubt it was anything good. Rumors I've heard say the Spetsnaz are developing a super soldier serum to help their doomed war in Ukraine. The fact that they also want to give it to secret agents in the USA boats poorly, I believe. They are already making plans to fight back in case of a full-scale war between Russia and the US. Zakhar and the Sheriff Corporation will undoubtedly want their money back. I have to always watch my back now, but if I meet them during the night time, I know I will have nothing to fear.